An NDP move to back a conservative demand for an emergency televised first minister's meeting quickened the pulse of Canadian politics this week. Who in this room is ready to axe the tax? We need government to take real action. It can't just be that our only approach to fighting the climate crisis is using free market solutions. That is not sufficient. I'll leave it to Jagmeet Singh to explain why he's stepping back from the urgency both of the fight against climate change and the need to put more money in families' pockets. Okay, so Jagmeet Singh appears there to be shifting his stance on the carbon tax, with Justin Trudeau saying the New Democrats are pulling back from both affordability measures and the fight against climate change. As the Liberals continue to defend their signature climate policy, rhetoric is starting to have a campaign ring to it. We're going to talk about all of that with our party insiders. No few thing or two about campaigns. Greg McEachern is a former liberal ministerial staffer. Melanie Riche is a former communications director for the NDP. We're going to ask her some questions today. <laughs> Fred Delory is a former conservative campaign manager. Oddly, I am going to start with Fred, but Fred, it's because you wanted to talk about what are the new Democrats doing on the carbon tax. Yeah, I would like to figure that out. I don't know if we'll do that here tonight. Um, but, you know, this is a very divisive issue in this country, the carbon tax right now. Poliev has done a great job of really uh, making it that top line issue. And of course, the April 1st when it went up, 23% didn't hurt. Uh, you know, the Liberals have a very clear position, the Conservatives have a clear position, very divisive issue, and the NDP have decided basically to have no position or both positions, it's not clear. I don't know how this helps them. Uh, if they are trying to compete with the, the ND or with the Liberals in the next election and eat some of that left-wing vote, this is a huge opportunity now for the Liberals if there is a big, and I don't know if this exists, if there is a pro-carbon tax contingency out there, if a constituency, there is opportunity for the Liberals to, uh, to swallow that up now. So, Mel, I am old enough to remember when the NDP voted in favor of the carbon tax because it was a month ago. Uh, what, what, what is going on now with Jagmeet Singh floating in the text of a speech, the suggestion there's a way to do this without it, and there is, right. uh, but he's always seemed to be on side with it. Now I don't know where he is on this. Right. It seems like he's moving away. Right. So I'm just going to pick up on what Fred said about how this is a divisive conversation, and I think that's what Jigme was trying to allude to this week. Mm -hmm. He was talking about how it's kind of being used um, a little bit as a wedge instead of what is the impact on people. If there is an impact on people, let's take a look at it and let's see if there are other measures that could be better, excuse me, and not impact people's wallets. Because if it's a choice between affordability and climate change, which is what he said in his speech, well, then people are going to say, I'm going to have to take um, a look at how this is impacting my budget. So, um, and, and I'll go back to, you know, I was around the, you know, I was in the, the war room in 2019 and I was on the bus in 2021. And in both those elections, when we were talking about the carbon tax, Jagmeet said in both those elections that this cannot be the only tool that we use to fight the climate crisis. But it's not. It, and right. it's not. But this can't be the only tool and it cannot disproportionately hurt people. And he's saying that. I think he's just saying it more. And in the conversation that we're having where this is a divisive conversation, I think um, it has a little bit more weight than maybe it used to when he used to say that. Now, I'll go back to, um, uh, you know, David Coletto was saying this week in polling that, you know, 27% of people think that Justin Trudeau is telling the truth on the carbon tax. 32% of people think that Pierre Poliev is telling the truth on the carbon tax. And the other 41% think that neither are telling the truth. Mm -hmm. So I do think that... Um, it is time to kind of have a, a grown-up conversation of where do we go with this conversation and how do we go forward to bring people together and we'll see we'll see well, we'll see uh, we'll see what happens um, well you, you know I, I think you're right a grown-up conversation on this is is badly needed but Greg where I come from grown-up <laughs> conversations include clear positions and facts and I don't know if the facts are a challenge in this conversation and clear positions now seem to be a, a challenge I don't know I would like to see a conversation between the Daniel Smith of a couple of years ago that talked about how much she got in the rebate and the Premier today. I'd like to see a conversation between Premier Blaine Higgs in New Brunswick, who last year opted into the carbon price, saying that it was good. He wanted to get the rebate for his... Uh, he his reluctantly book. opted in. Oh. Let, let's face it. No, no I mean, no, but, but, he, but, but... No, no, I understand. <laughs> but, you know, he, he wants oh, nothing. Dear. He wants no price on it. But he did say, if I have to have one, yeah, but at least those, there's a but rebate. those videos yeah, have, I gotcha. have I gotcha. surfaced. And, uh, you know, the point being, 
that it's because of that kind of disingenuousness that you see the NDP leader in the position that they're in. When I heard this last night, you know, you start texting your friends around politics, not just people in, in my party. And there was a feeling that this seems really odd. Mm. Suspect there'll be a walk back tomorrow. And there's kind of a walk back. Um, and it's basically, we haven't abandoned a carbon tax yet. Yeah. But we're building something <laughs> yeah. that will, and is what I take from this statement. Yeah, your media panel ground. earlier talked about how this may be, you know, the, the kind of indicates or telegraphs the struggle that they're having or that they sure. want to do something more. But I'll have to say, I had a little bit of deja vu when you hear of a politician kind of not getting a point out quickly enough and then the scramble to try to clarify it. I was like, wait. <laughs> They've been in the coalition with the Liberals for too long. <laughs> is this rubbing off? <laughs> yes. right. So, Fred, uh, look, uh, uh, on this point, like, they're a caucus full of new uh, British Columbians, right, yeah. or at least B B BC ridings, where there's an NDP government that has a carbon price that doesn't have a rebate system as robust as the federal one. It's got a, a, a means-tested tax rebate. You know, is this a winning position for them at a caucus level? Like, you seem to think there's daylight here for the Liberals to differentiate themselves and make gains. How do they begin to do that when this has become such a, a toxic political issue in the discourse? Well, look, in the B.C. Um, stance, there's, a, there's an election coming up there this mm. year, and it's a new Democrat government that uh, is doing very well in the polls. Uh, in some polls, I guess there is some tightening up there. Um, so they have to be mindful of, of these changing positions and how that will impact them. Uh, but in the, in, the, in the national picture, though, if there is a group of people that uh, really think the carbon tax and the, is uh, and the, the way to deal with climate change, it's going to be hard for uh, the NDP to go after that green vote in the next mm. election. And that opens the door now for the Liberals to, if they can uh, sell this in some way, and we haven't seen them do that yeah. yet. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so, Mel, just a quick final point on this before we get to your pick. It, it seems, though, like the conversation is very polarized. You know, there's axe attacks and there's eight and ten get more money back. Right. What's the middle ground there for the NDP to get in there and have it rise above that and, and be heard? Right. Well, well, I think what we're, we're uh, seeing them try to do is talk about how what we have now isn't actually doing what we need it to do and we're not meeting our emissions target and we're not doing enough. So in that conversation of, you know, affordability and fighting the climate crisis, I think they're trying to set a path where we can do both mm. of those things. And, and you know, we, we I think... In the response today, we saw a bit of a stay tuned to see what our plan right. will be. Um, and I'm excited to see what that will be. I think people who care about fighting the climate crisis um, are also excited to see what that will be. Um, but, but in the conversation of, you know, the carbon tax is important, I think t when you talked about uh, Premier Eby, I think he's really the only one who's being effective in yeah. saying, here's the reason why this is important. And, and it would be nice to see a little bit more of that at the federal table. I, I would be excited to see all the parties put out their climate yes. plans, give them to the parliamentary budget officer, yes. and let him do an assessment so we can have apples to apples comparisons of all the options on the table. But that's wish casting. That's right? <laughs> yeah, I know. That's, that's horrible. That's, <laughs> I know, I know, I know. It's, uh, you know, I, I, I'm a bit I'm hopelessly naive romantic. Mel, uh, you wanted to talk about what we heard from the NDP leader and the Conservative leader at the two big conferences happening in Ottawa this week. Yeah, we had two big conferences in Ottawa this week. Uh, Jigmeet was at the Progress Summit and we had uh, Pyat Padyev at the Canada Strong and Free uh, conference. Um, both of them, I think, near the same time giving speeches mm -hmm. and trying to rally the troops uh, almost in a, in a pre-election style uh, kind of speech. And um, one thing that I noticed in both of them is they both criticized the Prime Minister and kind of laid out a vision for what then. Um, you know, Jigmeet's criticism was he's not doing enough to hear you, to meet you, and to do the things that are going to make your life better. And, you know, Pyat Padyev, we heard he's got fluffy hair and he's kind of dumb. Like, that was the criticisms that we heard from Pyat Padyev. And I can't help but think that somebody tried that once and it didn't work. So if that's Padyev's only criticism for why mm. he needs to be um, prime minister instead of Justin Trudeau, I don't know that that's going to work in the next election. I also think, you know, we were talking last week about how um, sometimes it's almost like he can't help himself and he can't help but go and be a little bit mean-spirited. I think we saw a little bit of that in that speech as well. Um, and I don't think that that's what people are looking for in the next election. We will see. Um, what I liked about Jigmeet's speech is he really... Uh, laid out a vision about what New Democrats have been able to do in this government and what they would be able to do if they were government. So in the comparison of, we got you all of these things that will make a real difference in your life, that's going to impact your budget, that's going to impact your health, and then 
the prime minister's hiding in every room of your house. Mm -hmm. I know who I would vote for. Obviously, I'm biased, and I would probably be voting for him anyways. But uh, when you compared those two speeches this week, I thought one really laid a vision of meeting people where they're at and offering something better, and somebody who was just kind of meeting people where they're at and, and maybe making them angrier. And to be clear, this is the same speech where the carbon tax chaos comes yeah. from. Yeah, okay. <laughs> yes, no, you, no, you, but yeah, <laughs> I, I, I get you. No, a clear vision on a lot of things and some confusion there, but as you say, we stay tuned to that. But, but Greg, you know, they had this platform, the Broadband Institute's Progress Summit, what used to be called the Manning Center, is now the Canada Strong and Free Network. They had their platform there, very specific audiences for mm -hmm. very specific messages while well, your crowd's out doing the budget push. I mean, we're, what do you make of the, the contrast we saw laid out this week? Well, I do want to note that Boris Johnson was at the Conservative conference and told the Conservative Party they need to have some sort of plan to address climate change. Yeah. I hope they were listening. Um, I noted the kind of the meanness that Mel refers to as well. You get the impression that, he, you know, um, huge poll numbers have kind of told the leader of the opposition that he need, has to be more like he was in the past. And it's like he's running to be leader of the opposition. And Chris Selley in the National Post today, not exactly a bastion of liberal support, talked about how at some point um, he is going to have to put some meat in the bones and tell us you know, what he's going to do. The, the challenge is, I remember moving here to work for the Paul Martin government. Polls were showing that Paul was going to win 200, 200 plus seats, going to sweep Alberta, and then events happen. Um, you know, but if you have, you're attracting low information voters by telling them that the carbon price is you know, the bane of their existence and the problem for everything. Well, within three months of a new government coming in, those voters are going to be looking for real meaningful change in their lives. And, you know, the reality is probably not going to happen. So that's, I think, going to be extremely mm -hmm. tough for them. The other thing I'd just say is uh, um, they kind of bookended, they finished the pre-budget announcements today. Uh, big announcement in Vaughan with uh, Sean Fraser, the Prime Minister and the Deputy Prime Minister. Um, I, I, we have the budget next week. I think if my math is correct, um, carbon rebates start to show up in bank accounts around Monday, that time as yeah, well. Monday. So um, what's really interesting is when the, the Liberals were doing these pre-budget announcements, we didn't see a lot of the Conservative leader until uh, this conference. Right, no, that's interesting. But, you know, as Mel said, he did come out with a fire and brimstone speech, Fred, you know, for the party base, which is really what this conference is about. Mm -hmm. But there was some of that personal attack stuff that, that people have warned could be a problem for him going forward. Yeah, he's been on a tour across the country doing this exact yeah. same speech. It is a new, it was a, a very partisan um, uh, group of uh, conservative thinkers, I guess you'd call them, uh, that was uh, at the Canada Strong and Free Network. Um, but this is the same messaging that he does across the board. This is who he is. He is uh, mm -hmm. elbows up. He is pushing out his message on what he thinks is broken and how he wants to fix it. It's not a lot of detail. There's no question. He doesn't. We do need, and hopefully, I think in a campaign, we'll see what his plans are. Um, but you know, his tone is that's, that's who Pierre Polyev is. Yep. He is aggressive. Um, he's not going to change. Okay, Greg, uh, we got about three and a half minutes left. Let's uh, talk about, you want to talk about the foreign interference inquiry. A liberal actually wants to talk about uh, the foreign <laughs> interference inquiry. <Yeah. laughs> I said to Mel before we went on air, I'm like, I don't know if I'm making the right choice here, but, <laughs> but, here, we go. Uh, but here we go. Well, you know, I talked last week about how breathless the reporting was last year. And we have this inquiry because of reporting. And um, so I think a lot of liberals were very tense on this. So if I could just set aside you know, the impact, uh, the very important impact to our country about foreign interference. From a political perspective, I don't think that the Liberals ended up this week with a mark on them because of this, but there are some questions around the reporting from last year and what was heard. And I thought one of the very interesting things was when um, either people from the Prime Minister's office or the Prime Minister talked about the inability going back to CSIS and say, look, this has been reported. We know it's not factual. How much can we push back here? And they were told none until this inquiry. So we do have that. I mean, I, you know, I haven't seen, unless I missed it today, an anonymous op-ed in the Globe and Mail um, from a whistleblower saying, this is why I did this. So I think that's important. The other thing that I noticed a few people, and I want to kind of clarify, you introduced me every week as a former ministerial staffer. Mm. I had secret clearance. I didn't have top secret. Um, but you have to handle documents. And there's this little, they say, a discrepancy between Telford saying last year the prime minister reads everything that's given to him and him saying that he gets a lot of briefings or, orally. That, that, that's not, those two things can be true at the same time. Sure. 
paper, top secret paper, secret paper in government. There is a whole process around it. And I can understand that a document comes in a room, it's used to, to drive the, the meeting, but it may leave the room with that person because it has to be handled very carefully. I remember hearing stories about monitors going through uh, ministerial offices at night, and if you had left out secret or top secret documents, you could get a flag on that. You could lose your secret or top secret clearance, and you may lose your job because your right. job may be dependent on that. So I think that's a really important thing for people to realize in terms of the handling of these documents. It's not just coming in and out of, in briefcases. But so, Fred, I just want to a high level assessment of where we are because the the public testimony from the key players is over now mm -hmm. and we've seen a lot of exhibits they're redacted they're fragmented as is the testimony that is the nature no no as but, predicted but, it but the central allegation here has been China was meddling mm -hmm. not disputed the liberals knew about it not disputed but they ignored it because it was to their benefit that's how you break it down they ignored it and it was to their benefit I don't think that has been conclusively proven by what we've heard here. I had Ward Elcock and Dick Fadden sitting here, and they said they've seen nothing that would suggest it, the response from the government was improper. And even David Vigneault, who everyone says was issuing the warnings that people were ignoring, he said today none of what they saw affected the outcome of the election. So where are we with this thing at this point? Exactly where we were this time last year when I was talking to you about this. Uh, we're doing nothing to actually address foreign interference. Uh, there's no actual process in place right now uh, to try to plug these holes, and the, the holes I think have been identified. It's just these different organizations, the uh, CSIS and what mm -hmm. Elections Canada, need to be able to communicate and talk to each other and see if there's real threats. Uh, I've been on the show and I've, I went to committee on this very matter and, and talked to it. Did it impact the election? There's no evidence it impacted the election. I didn't see anything like that. It was there might have been stuff happening. Different actors are doing things, but. Okay, Mel, I got about 20 seconds, then we got to give the network away. What yeah, are your yeah, thoughts? no, I was just going to say a lot of what, what these two have already said is like, okay, now this has happened. It wasn't what we thought it was going to be. Where do we go now to make sure that our elections are protected from any interference? And like next steps, I think, is what everybody's kind of looking for at this yeah. point. Yeah, Justice Ogg is going to have her, her report on May 3rd. Sure. I, I have no <laughs> idea what it's going to say, but I'm really looking to see how those conclusions, if they differ, how they differ mm -hmm. from David Johnston and mm -hmm. where that leaves this whole conversation. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you, gang. Love it every Friday. Greg McKecker, Melanie Richet, and Fred Delore.